Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number three of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Um, before we start tonight, just a, uh, one real quick announcement or reminder, um, kind of both. Uh, Myth Moot, of course, is coming up. That is primarily what is on my mind as we are now <clears throat> not quite less right about a fortnight away from Myth Moot. Um, which is uh, uh, which is awesome. Um, there is still time to sign up. Uh, so we just got some signups today. I saw so uh, still time, still time to sign up. You will also see uh, the schedule is uh, is uh, posted on the site uh, signumuniversity.org/mythmoot. Um, uh, so you can see that, and uh, uh, I'm excited to welcome as many people as possible for uh, Mootcast, Moot Hub, and uh, in-person attendance. By the way, obviously, there is um, there's a need for a new word, isn't there? Hasn't this become more and more obvious to everyone else? I mean, I've been suffering under this for years, but I would think that I'm surprised that a better word has not yet emerged. Like a word that means something that's happening in person instead of something that's happening virtually. Because sometimes people want to say live, right? But that's not good, right? I mean, this is a live event too. Here we are. <laughs> like we're still alive even if we're uh, connected digitally. So um, that's not good. I And like my second pet peeve uh, related to this is that I dislike the word virtual uh, because it's not a virtual conference. It's a real... Like, I, it's not a virtual conference if it's being held online. It's a real conference. Um, it might be digital, right? But you're still actually getting together. But there is a distinction, right? There's a distinction. So I prefer digital. Um, corporeal could work, Arthur, if people would use it. Um, you can attend corporeally. I, that works for me. Let's give it a whirl, Arthur. Let's, maybe it'll catch on. Um, but... Um, uh, but yeah, that I think is, um, should, you know, um, should do the trick. Hmm, Michelle's wondering if there's a problem with the Twitch feed. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's on. Um, but, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, sorry, um, Arthur, I see that, um, there's a, there's an issue with, uh, the rumble chat. I'm sorry about that. Uh, no idea what to do. I'll, I'll have to call Mike. Uh, yeah, I agree, Stephen. Um, uh, well, I'm interested to hear that Twitch would seem to be not working. As far as I can tell, it is. <laughs> so I don't know what else to say about that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I can look, sort of. But... Um, uh, but as far as I know, as far as I know, it's working. Hang on a second. I'll just, I'll try to double check, I suppose. But it appears to be live. And um, I think, uh, hmm, how interesting. Well, yeah. So Twitch seems to be having an issue. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> but um, I, I seem to be live everywhere else. Not sure what's, what's troubling Twitch. Oh, goodness. All kinds of difficulties here today. Well, uh, not sure what to say. We'll soldier on. Um, it seems to be broadcasting fine to YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. So... We'll just have to put up with that, I suppose. Um, oh, there's the chat. Okay, there we go. All right, yes. Um, exactly, yes. Yeah, Stephen is saying we've taught the, uh, the the Twitch and Rumble chat servers to, to, uh, to make jokes, apparently. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, 
Oh, Arthur says he'll, he guesses he'll have to send all my comments directly to you. Wait, Arthur, are you meaning to say that you don't? <laughs> oh, that's alarming, Arthur. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Um, okay. Well, and yet here we are, and here we shall, uh, we shall, uh, <laughs> we shall continue. Um, so anyway, yeah, Mythmoot schedule. You should come. That's it, corporeally or uh, whatever. Um, but um, <laughs> I see. Carrie says we filter Arthur. Uh, only approve funny always, right? Okay. Now well, that that's I Carrie, I do appreciate that. I'm now imagining you all uh, looking at long rolls of, of of computer printout with Arthur's jokes on them. Uh, you know, m- making tick marks next to them and deciding which ones are, are are not funny, which ones are funny once, and which one are funny always. That's um. Uh, I think I think Carrie, that's now going to be like my permanent image for like what is happening in Rumble Chat now. Um, <laughs> that I, so thank you for that. That's really useful. Um, uh, <laughs> but but at least there we go. Okay. Anyhow, let us move forward uh, in, in towards the revolution here. So we were talking about. Uh, last time we spent a lot of time talking about Mike um, and looking at, at Manny's relationship with Mike, um, and then we were looking at the beginning of the revolution and uh, the debate uh, in the uh, uh, the original talk talk that causes all the troubles uh, before uh, Wyo and Manny end up hiding out in the hotel. And um, uh, let's go backwards though a little bit back to chapter one because what right right where we got up to was looking at kind of the when these two things begin to come together right um how does you know we've got the character of mike uh and we have manny's relationship with him that we talked about how so we talked about mike and we talked about the the revolution and now kind of how these things begin uh to come together so this is in the end Near, uh, near the end of that very first conversation between Mike and Manny. Then I got brain flash. This playful pocket of negative entropy had invented a joke and thrown authority into panic, and I had made an easy dollar. But Mike's endless curiosity might lead him, correction, would lead him into more jokes. Anything from leaving oxygen out of air mix some night to causing sewage lines to run backward, and I can't appreciate profit in such circumstances. But I might throw a safety circuit around this net by offering to help. Stop dangerous ones, let others go through. Then collect for correcting them. If you think any loony in those days would hesitate to take advantage of Warden, then you aren't a loony. So I explained. Any new, ju- any new joke he thought of, tell me before he tried it. I would tell him whether it was funny and what category it belonged in, help him sharpen it if we decided to use it. We. If he wanted my cooperation, we both had to okay it. Mike agreed at once. So this is the beginning of the active collusion between Mike and Manny. And it begins here with Manny's brain flash, which, as you can see, has two separate roots, right? On the one hand, um, it has the number one root of his brain flash is his desire to profit off of this, right? This is a really good scam if it looks like the computer is malfunctioning, which is certainly how everyone else on Luna is going to interpret this. No one else, because nobody suspects that Mike is awake, no one else is going to suspect Mike of making a joke on purpose. There must be something wrong with his programming, something wrong with his circuitry. So... They're going to hire Mike because Mike is the only, or sorry, they're going to hire Manny because Manny's the only one who can fix him, right? So the more jokes, you know, uh, but it has to be the correct pacing, right? And the right kind and everything. And uh, so that, um, uh, so that Manny can get called in. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I did forget to do that. Sorry about that. Boyle. Technology's all over the place, isn't it today? Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, uh, so the, um, that's that's the first goal, right? The first goal is for Manny just to make a profit. It's a selfish plan, but it's not an entirely selfish plan because part of his concern also is that Mike's jokes might get way more inappropriate, right? 
um, as he suggested, <laughs> leaving oxygen out of the air mix might possibly be one of the jokes that he chooses to play. Notice how how far um, Manny assumes that Mike is kind of out of touch with humanity, right? Um, he's not crediting Mike either with caring enough to know that leaving the oxygen out of the mix would care people or, or would kill people or not even realizing it. Right. Um, uh, but he, he, he clearly is kind of anticipating this as at least a potentially inadvertent side effect. Right. And not to mention the fact that of course it could conceivably kill him and his family as well as you know, they are also, their systems are also controlled by Mike. So um, it's, con you know, there's, an element of selfishness involved in this as well, but it is a little bit more, um, it is, yeah, right, Bruce says, that would be, by definition, a funny once. Yes, truly. Um, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so I do think that it, it's mo that still sort of mostly selfish, but we can see an element here of, protectiveness, of sort of civic mindedness. Um, he does want to step in and make sure that Mike is not going to harm anybody. But notice also there's another element here, at least another element, not in his motivation, but in his method. Right. And his method is to be in cahoots with Mike. Right. Let's agree together on the joking thing. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll help you with your jokes. Right. Um, and I'll tell you whether or not they're funny and I'll help you make the joke better and I'll help you make it more funny. Um, but only if you promise to tell me before you make another joke. Right. So he's asserting a kind of control. Right. Having putting Mike under his supervision, at least. Right. Bringing Mike under his supervision. Um, and yet that seems to me that strikes me as something not rooted in like, you know, Manny's desire to control Mike, but actually is, is a sign of respect for Mike. He doesn't try to prevent him, right? He doesn't try to stop the jokes. He could, for instance, I mean, it's in his power. He's the repairman called in to fix Mike. He could fix him, theoretically. He could try to do something. He could try to implement a program to stop Mike doing things. Now, it probably wouldn't work, right? Mike is too smart for that. Um, but still, like, that never even occurs to him. Nothing like that occurs to him, right? But, but like, let's, let me get Mike's agreement to move forward in this particular way, right, under my supervision, um, is, a, I think, a very kind of generous approach uh, that Manny takes with Mike. That from, you know, once he finds that Mike is awake, Manny seems to me to treat Mike like a person consistently from then on. Like he does not, he stops treating him or even thinking of him as simply a tool, as simply a machine um, from that point forward. Um, it is like, again, it's it's similar to, now he does treat, he's several times said that he's like a child, right? And he does treat him like a child. Um, the way that he corrects him, you know, automatically, right? I mean, he without a pause, without a qualm, um, you know, he just steps in and corrects Mike. Like, no, 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 Mike, that's wrong, right? You know, not like that, Mike. Don't do that, Mike. Um, there's something, I, I, you know, as we were saying last time, if not parental, then at least avuncular about Manny's relationship with Mike. Um, but nevertheless, still personable, right? Um, yeah, and Chris, you're right. He doesn't lose sight of the very different worldview uh, that Mike has compared to that of an organic being. I agree. Even his concerns, right, about the oxygen and stuff are connected with that, right? That Mike not, might not fully parse the fact. Um, I mean, like, does Mike even understand death? Like, really understand death and what it means? It's something I think maybe Manny doesn't absolutely take for granted, here, um, at least not yet at this stage. Um, I think we're going to get we're going to get past that. And uh, Stephen, that's a really good distinction. Um, Stephen says he views Mike as um, a person, not as a human. Yes, exactly. He doesn't just treat him like a human. He doesn't mistake him for a human, but he does treat him like a person. And Stephen, this seems to me a really important extension or offshoot of the. Um, 
uh, of the um, the whole Looney attitude, right? The entire um, connection uh, between like, the way in which all of these different cultures and different um, uh, you know people come together. That kind of this general acceptance of anybody. Right. No matter what their background, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, um, it's it's an extension of it. Right. It's 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 definitely not just yet another example of that exact same thing. Um, but it does seem to me related uh, to that in as much as Manny is, you know, like the quintessential loony. Um, it's easy for him to make this particular um, um, to make this particular leap or step, perhaps. It's not even exactly, um, it's not even exactly uh, a leap. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Ellen, I, yes, I do think that it is important. Manny's role throughout the story, right? He is the one who is at the boundary, right? He, like, represents the boundary between human and machine, right? Between alive and not alive, as you say. I mean, none of his arms are alive, right? His left arms, I mean. Um, but he considers them part of him, right? Um, and so there are ways in which his own dismemberment and his response to his dismemberment have led him to think differently already in ways that just make this transition, I think, uh, much easier. Make that step a sort of a smaller step. Um, now, um, um, but James, you're right. Again, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that Manny is still also trying to profit here. His goal, he does not have. Notice how far he is from thinking in the terms that eventually are going to come around to, right? Like when he is connecting with a warden's computer, it never, it does not occur to him. At least it's, I say it never occurs to him. No, it doesn't ever occur to him. It never occurs to him to attempt to utilize his relationship with Mike for revolution, right? For changing the world, right? For overthrowing the warden. He, even after he has established this relationship with Mike, um, he will still be saying, it's not possible, there's nothing we can do to overthrow the warden, right? Um, even though you'd think it could occur to him from this point, right? That uh, he could he could stop the oxygen in the warden's house and the rooms of all the guards, right? Very easily, right? Um, it Mike would make it trivial to overthrow the regime. Um, but that is not in his mind. And again, even when they're talking about overthrowing the regime, um, they're still, he's still making jokes like the rest of them are. <clears throat> what are we going to do? Throw rocks at him, right? At the warden, right? Um, it never occurs to him. It's just, this is not in his worldview. Overthrowing the warden isn't in his worldview. Remember, he compared um, dealing with the authority to dealing with the law of gravitation, right? That's the loony perspective. It's, this is just how things are. Um, it's not great, but um, uh, it's not great, but it's but it is um, uh, but it is how things are, right? Um, and he's not gonna he's he deals with how things are. He's not gonna try to change how things are, right? He can try to improve things in small ways like this, right? Hey, I can I can uh, I can make a quick buck this way. I can what you know by encouraging Mike's jokes. He can do jokes all over the place, not like constantly so that they think they've got to replace him or, or, or you know, bring up a new machine or something like that from Earth. But but if we can do this just right, I can make a mint this way. Right. Continual jobs for the You know, I could get a steady stream of income. That's like the height of his ambition here. Right. Um, and I think it, it, it shows something pretty interesting about kind of the loony perspective here. Um, uh, yeah, and now, Devorah, you're absolutely right. It's not just about overthrowing the warden, right? I mean, if you were to kill off the warden and all of his guards, that's only it's, that's only going to create problems, right? You know, he knows the problem is with Terra, um, as he explains 
early on, right? And it's going to take him a while before he even really begins to think that that's um, uh, that that's a uh, kind of um, you know uh, that there is a solution that Mike is possibly uh, able to give a solution uh, to that too. Um, but anyway, um, so what else was I going to say about this? I think, right, just like the humble beginnings, notice the humble beginnings of this, but it's still, this is still an important moment, despite the fact that he's not thinking in that direction at all, right? Um, he is, um, but this is still a, a very important moment because he is, for the first time, actively colluding with Mike, right? realizing that there's profit, there's usefulness um, in this relationship with the computer. And that, again, I think tells us something important about Manny, right? It's not his first thought, right? His first thought when he discovers that Mike is awake, he first starts treating him like a fellow person, not because he thinks he can gain from it, but because he thinks Mike is a person, right? I mean, there's a, um, yes, he does get a selfish plan, though it's a fairly modest selfish plan, um, and certainly not one that is at Mike's expense. Um, in fact, again, he's able to include Mike and, in fact, even support Mike's own interests here, which is, um, you know, exploring and developing his sense of humor. Um, Mike will genuinely appreciate this. Mike will genuinely profit from this. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, Mike, we could think about parallels between like Luna in Australia and Luna in America. Um, I'm I'm not going to talk too much about that, nor am I going to talk too much about how the story relates to um, like contemporary Cold War politics. Um, mostly just because that feels to me like an application of the story rather than a um, sort of an examination of it. And also, yeah, I mean, that'll... I'm not going to talk about that because I want to keep the focus of our discussion on the story itself rather than I get into, like, the other things that might be relevant to the story or other ways in which the story could be applied. Um, so I'm not in general going to kind of go through that because, again, like to discuss the parallels between Luna and Australia or Luna and America would be not to be to stop in a sense, right? Talking about the book and begin talking about Australia, you know, the history of Australia and the history of America, um, which is a digression. I think I'm going to resist. Same thing with the Cold War thing. Is it relevant? Yeah, of course it's relevant. Um, and there might be some moments when it's relevant enough that I I think it really bears talking about in the context of trying to understand one of the passages. But um, but really, that's kind of my rule uh, with this. Again, not that I think those things are inappropriate to think or, or talk about, but that's 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 what you could do. Like, for instance, uh, that makes an excellent mood paper, right? If you want to if you want to uh, do a comparison between Luna and Australia and say, uh, you know, so looking at the, the position of Australia and the relationship between Australia and Britain and the relationship between Luna and Terra. Uh, and, 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 you know, think about those parallels and, um, you know, what <clears throat> Heinlein is, uh, is seems to be suggesting about those parallels or, um, you know, whatever. What a wonderful mood paper topic that would be. That'd be very interesting. Um, so. <clears throat> OK, Devorah. I think my answer to your question is no, but that's not going to stop me. Devora asks, um, are we ready to talk about who Manny is writing this for now? No, I'm not. But let's raise it um, because I want to keep thinking about this. Um, it's either, Devora, it's both too soon and too late <laughs> to talk about that. I feel like the places where I feel like that's most relevant is the very beginning, like those first couple paragraphs, and the very end of the story, right? The frames, essentially, of this narrative. Because in both frames, Manny, the narrator, Manny as narrator, is much more self-consciously addressing his audience, right? In the midst of the, of the narrative, most of the time through, we'll actually see one other example, Devorah. There are moments, right, when he is, 
he betrays something about the like or like betrays a self consciousness in his narrative that he is telling a story for the benefit of other people. Right? There are times when he like turns and addresses his audience directly, um, and there might be some things that we can note about that from time to time as we go. I, I, I can think off the top of my head of at least one passage um, tonight. I don't know for sure that we'll get to it tonight. That might be a next week passage after all. But um, but anyway, there there are definitely some uh, some points where that happens, and so. Devorah, we'll kind of throw that out there and we'll think about in moments when we can see that, moments when we can see Manny addressing his, in the you know, first person narrator, addressing the audience, see if there's any data that we can get from that. Um, the one thing that was very clear um, was the time frame. Right? Well, OK, it's clear that he's addressing a lunar audience. Right. He's he seems to be addressing and he seems to be addressing like the next generation of lunar people. Right. To what end? What people exactly? By what mechanism? Um, that's not really sure. That's not really certain. Um, and Stephen, good. Stephen points. Um, uh, Stephen points to right here. Right. Uh, yes. If you think any loony in those days would hesitate to take advantage of warden, then you aren't a loony. Yes. Um, you. Right. There's his audience. Right. In the second person. Um, and in those days, that's another really important thing, right? One of those reminders, which we do get sprinkled throughout, of the time frame, right? In those days, back in the old days, back in the bad old days, right? Um, our thing, you know, so we get a glimpse of the future. In other words, one thing, um, Devorah, that I think is most clear, right, uh, is that these things add up to a spoiler, don't they? Right? Right? Uh, that the revolution is going to succeed. That concept seems to be implanted all the way through. From We saw it in the very beginning. It seems to be implied to me in that very first paragraph, right? But several times through, there is the indication that what is taking place, right? The time frame in which the story is happening were in times when things were much worse than they are at the present when Manny is actually narrating, right? Um... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you think any loony in those days would hesitate to take advantage of Warden, then you aren't a loony. Um, which statement seems to me both to take for granted the fact that he's talking to loonies, and second, to acknowledge that some of the people, at least some of the people who might be reading or listening to or what in whatever medium they're going to be digesting this narrative are going to be sufficiently culturally removed that they need an aside like this, right? Um, he's saying this, this goes without saying, right? All loonies th would think this way. So either he's speaking to a potentially non-loony audience or he is speaking to an audience that where he at least is... Um, worried or speculating that the values might have shifted such that they wouldn't, he can't take these things um, for granted. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so good. I agree, Stephen. I'd almost uh, missed that in this, that aside in this context. And when we, well, so Devorah, try to remind me uh, when we see asides like that, be on the lookout for other um notes like that, which help to indicate the audience, and we'll try to build a composite picture uh, from those as we move through. All right. Watch where he goes. Now, this is the second time he is actively colluding with Mike, but notice the difference here already. This is before he's signed on, right? The meeting has happened. This is from the hotel room with Wyo. Wyo's in the bathroom, right? Um, so he hasn't brought Wyo in yet um, with, uh, with Mike. Um, but this is after the meeting has happened. So he's been, he's begun to be involved in the revolutionary stuff, but he still doesn't believe in it. He does not consider himself a part of the revolution, right? But notice the difference. Man, you wish, you, you wish me to monitor your call to your home and put a lock and trace on it? I must inform you that I already know your home call number and the number from which you are calling. No, no, don't want it monitored. Don't want it locked and traced. 
Can you call my home, connect me, and control circuit so that it can't be monitored, can't be locked, can't be traced, even if somebody has programmed just that? Can you do it so that they won't even know their program is bypassed? Mike hesitated. I suppose it was a question never asked, and he had to trace a few thousand possibilities to see if his control of system permitted this novel program. Man, I can do that. I will. Good. Uh, program signal. If I want this sort of connection in future, I'll ask for Sherlock. Noted. Sherlock was my brother. Year before, I had explained to Mike how he got his name. Thereafter, he read all Sherlock Holmes stories, scanning film in Luna City Carnegie Library. Don't know how he rationalized r relationship. I hesitated to ask. Fine. Give me a Sherlock to my home. Okay. So, notice the important good, James, the year before, right? His relationship with Mike has been going on for some time. I don't know that we got a temporal register for it. There was a point at which he just re realized that Mike was awake. Um, and it might be, it might not be a year before, but the year before. So it could be less than a year ago uh, that this had happened conceivably. Um, uh, but it sounds like something that happened fairly early in their relationship, though not the very beginning, right? Um, because he had already gotten to know Mike and given him a nickname in his own head, and it was sometime after that, presumably, that he told him what his nickname was and explained it to him. And that, in turn, was the year before. Um, so, so yes, his relationship with Mike... And, and again, one of the things that this shows me, um, to kind of double down on some of the points I was making on the previous slide, um, Manny... It took Manny a long time even to try to profit in simple ways. He's been friendly with Mike for some time. He's been, a, uh, he's, he's been aware of the fact that Mike is awake for a long time. And he has been friendly with Mike for a substantial quantity of time before it ever occurred to him on that first meeting that we get in the story back in chapter one to try to get Mike to do anything or to profit from that relationship in any way. Um, and, uh, that's, that I think tells us some more about Manny, right? And helps to really emphasize the extent to which his relationship with Mike, first and foremost, is just, he has immediately accepted him as a fellow person and person and just treats him like a fellow person. Um, yeah. I mean, if uh, you meet somebody and the first time you meet them, you are immediately thinking, like, how can I profit from my connection to this person, right? You're probably doing it wrong. Uh, you know, the whole making friends thing, right? Um, uh, and we see that uh, Manny doesn't, doesn't do that. But now notice this, the difference in this second way, right? Um, the difference in this second subversion of Mike, the second collusion with Mike. Um, first, notice Mike's confusion. Um, Manny has just asked if Mike is able to place a call that can't be locked or traced. And Mike doesn't even parse his sentence properly, right? This is one of the only examples, I think, that we get in the book of Mike actually misunderstanding something that Manny says. It doesn't often happen, but it did happen here on this very significant occasion. Right. Um, because this is the first time that Mike is not only colluding with him like a fellow person, you know, like they were before kind of conspiring uh, together to uh, develop Mike's sense of humor at the expense of the authority. Right. Um, uh, which is good in every way. Now he is actually asking him asking him to work again, to do something, if not against the law, clearly against the authority, clearly undermining the authority, preventing the authority from carrying out its authority, right? Um, preventing them being, you know, um, as he said, even if, um, even if somebody has programmed just that, right? Somebody may well be trying to trace phone calls from your early phone calls to my home. Right. They might be putting a trace on anybody who calls my home right now. And I want you to help me get around that. I want you to help make sure 
that I am not going to get caught. Now, on the one hand, we can see, as before, um, uh, um, as before that... Um, Once again, Manny's motivations are selfish. He's trying to protect himself, right, and his family, right. Um, but he, but selfish as regards to Mike, right. He's not thinking of Mike here. He's thinking of himself here. He is thinking, hey, Mike could be a useful friend to have right now. He, Mike, could enable it, could enable me to be able to call home without being traced, without putting myself or my family at risk. Um, and so again, I, I'm not saying that it's a horrible thing for him to want, um, but once again, we see him thinking in these uh, just uh, just about about himself, about his himself, his own profit, and and here now his own safety. But he has never pushed in this direction before. Um, even with the joking, even with the first collusion, it's still Mike's own initiative that he's merely trying to curb. Right. Or supervise at the very least. Right. Here he is asking Mike to do something. He is initiating that. And what's more, he is asking Mike to do something more or less illegal. Right. Something against the authority. Um, something that certainly he wouldn't want anybody to know that he was doing. Um, obviously, I uh, wouldn't want anyone to know that Mike was doing. Um, uh yeah, Ellen, you're right. He is kind of using Mike like a tool in this case, but he's still asking nicely. Yes, yes. And notice, Ellen, that Manny seems to be aware of that, right? Um, notice that he characterizes, as narrator, he characterizes it as this novel program, right? This is a program that Mike is being asked to run for Manny, right? Um, so he is treating him like a tool. But again, the difference is the politeness, the asking nicely, I would say, is significant. It's not just a flavor, right? It's important. And we can see it reflected in Mike's response. Man, I can do that. I will. Two separate things. Is it possible to do that? Yes. First, he has to figure out if it's possible. And then he decides that, yes, he will do that. Um, you know, he will he will do this thing um, for uh, for Manny and Manny doesn't um, notice that he. Interestingly, Ellen, I was just noticing this. He doesn't even ask that, actually. Notice what he's asking here is, can you do it? He, he, he says he explains what he wants. And all he does is say, can you do it? Can you do it? Can you do this? And it's Mike who volunteers actually to do it. Right? Now, I'm presuming Manny was gonna, in fact, say, great, then would you please? Right? Um, but he doesn't actually do it. Mike volunteers it. Right? Mike does show not only volition, but initiative there. Man, I can do that. I will. Now, is the request implied in the whole? Yes, the request is. Again, I'm not trying to say that I think that Manny was not actually asking Mike. He is. But I do think it's important, right? I do think it's important that he is, he's not, notice the difference between how he approaches this and how he approaches correcting Mike, right? He doesn't have any qualms about telling Mike, Mike, don't do that, right? Don't say it that way, Mike. Um, um, uh, you know, don't, don't say why not again. Uh, you know, that was funny once. Um, he, you know, when he thinks Mike is making an inappropriate joke later on, uh, he immediately corrects him. Mike, not funny. Um, don't do that. Don't say that. Um, but he doesn't take that tone. He doesn't take that parental uh, or avuncular tone here, which is good. Because if he did, then it would begin to be, if not abusive, then at least exploitative. Right? I'm going to um, take our relationship and use that as a means to make you do what I want you to do. But there's none of that tone with Manny here. He doesn't cross that line. Um, he is asking for something that benefits him directly um, uh, and asking, this is him definitely asking a favor of Mike um, for the first time. But it's Mike who volunteers and, you know, I think that, and, and, and when he said, you know, does the 
pro, you know, program signal if I want this sort of connection in future I'll ask for Sherlock that's just Manny speaking Mike's language right he knows how Mike thinks he knows that by taking this instruction which he has now parsed and giving it a a, 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 a keyword right giving it a uh, a search string, right, that he can attach to it. He's making things simpler for Mike. He's he is uh, he's helping Mike there in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Stephen, you're right. Um, so far, Mike does everything Manny asks for, and nothing indicates that Mike understands right and wrong. I agree. I agree. Um, Carrie's wondering if Mike even realizes that he himself didn't have a loyalty or legal issue with Luna, Terra, or the Authority. Um, it's a really good question to ask, does, but wait, that's illegal, or, but wait, that's against the rules, or, but wait, that's wrong. Would any of those things mean anything to Mike? Um, I think probably yes, but I don't think that they would... Do I think he has a concept of right and wrong? Do I think he has a concept of good and bad? Do I think he has a concept of um, legal and illegal? Yes, but I don't think in these terms. Um, that is to say, I don't think he cares what the authority wants and doesn't want, right? Um, that was already shown by his joke. I'm pretty sure that Mike knew that it was not the intention <laughs> of the authority to pay the janitor, <laughs> you know, ten million billion dollars. Um, I'm pretty sure he knew that, right? Um, so we've already seen that he's perfectly willing to um, do things that are against the wishes of the authority. That he does not care about that. But that's not part of his morality. Right. Um, what is right? Exactly. Carrie, he stole billions for that joke. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Or at least, you know, would have done had the check been cashed, which it couldn't be. But um, yeah, he. There are some things which are laws, right, which he can't break, as we'll see a little bit later on. Um, but um but yeah, Devorah, I, I, I agree with you. We have seen a good and bad. We have seen a value judgment, right? Um, with the stupids and the not stupids. Mike knows some people are stupid and some people are not stupid. And that is for Mike a value judgment, right? It's not about mere level of intelligence. And that becomes clear fairly quickly. I think that by using that terminology, Mike seems to imagine that that's the case. There's a really interesting, um, isn't it a really interesting uh, uh, kind of symmetry, right? Manny is the only person on Luna who has realized that Mike is awake, right? Um, and that Mike is the only computer in Luna and, po and probably Earth as well, um, which is awake and a real person. But similarly, Manny is the only person whom Mike has counted as a real person, right? It's like of all the human beings that Mike has ever encountered, most of them, like most computers that Manny has encountered, right, are just, remember that image at the, in the very first paragraph of the other computers all whispering to each other in the background, right? That's like other people talking to each other and doing whatever, right? The stupids in Mike's world, right? They're just, they're like those whispering machines, Right uh, on the other side of the room, which don't mean anything by it. There's no reason to pay attention to their sounds because they're stupid, right? Um, they're not aware. They're not awake. Uh, Manny is, right? Because Manny noticed him. So there's there's a real reciprocity there. So when Devora, when Mike is talking about stupids and not stupids, right? I do think that there's, like Mike is the only computer sophisticated enough to become awake, I think that he also kind of looks at Manny that way too, right? The rest of the people are too stupid uh, to wake up, right? And, uh, and like, become people, become awake, um, become aware of themselves. 
um, in the way that Manny obviously is and aware of him, of course. Um, so I don't think I don't think it would be fair for that reason to merely take his category of stupids and not stupids as a way of, um, you know, like him defining a kind of like morality by level of intelligence. Exactly. That doesn't seem to me to be right, um, because I think that his his own categories get much more um, uh, much more complex after this, after this conversation, when Prof gets brought in and, you know, the revolution begins, um, Mike's attitude towards people changes, right? He's no longer distinguishing between stupids and not stupids. Um, he is, I, I think with Prof, it's the last time that that um, distinction is made, uh, as far as I remember. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Ellen, you're right that Manny is giving Mike the room to come to a decision and assuming that Mike has choice, discernment, will, and personality. He absolutely does, um, uh, clearly from the beginning. Um, uh, Mike is learning from Manny's assumptions to meet Manny at that level of complexity. I wonder. Yeah, I mean, is... Manny acknowledges that like most of what Mike learns about being a person... Right. Um, he learns from them and we'll see uh, we'll see an example of that uh, in a minute. I keep saying I keep alluding to future slides, which suggests to me I should move on to more slides. Uh, but uh, I, we'll 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 get there. Um, but of course, Ellen, there's other data points as well, um, which comes back to a question from earlier that I didn't answer. Uh, Bruce, um, about why a computer would want to read fiction. That's why. Right. Because he can come to understand about people uh, what it means to be a person uh, from reading fiction. That's not to say that he's just going to model himself after them any more than he's necessarily just uh, going to follow Manny necessarily. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, Stephen, I think he's read a lot of fiction. I mean, he's read every book in the library, Mike, or, uh, Manny says. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I suppose uh, if he'd read this book written back in 1966, that would have uh, created some kind of paradox, wouldn't it, Stephen? Um, okay, but let's uh, no. But notice that last comment, um, Manny saying that he hesitated to ask how Mike rationalized the relationship. Right when like uh, what exactly is going on in Mike's mind when he says Sherlock was my brother? Manny's like, I don't even want to know. <laughs> I don't even want to know exactly what he means by that. Um, uh, and that's interesting, right? Uh, that um, his hesitation to ask that. And I, I don't know why he's hesitating. Does he think he won't understand it? Uh, d does he think, I don't know, it'll uh, blow his mind? Does he think it will lessen his opinion of Mike? I don't know exactly why he hesitates, but... Um, uh, but I think it's an interesting comment anyway. Okay. Near the end of this conversation, this conversation, the second one, when he is subverting uh, Mike to work against the authority for the first time, Manny ends by saying, Mike, your best friend I ever had. Which is, of course, again, back to, you know, Ellen, what you were saying about him using Mike as a tool for the first time in conjunction with him declaring friendship uh, for Mike, in fact, saying he's, you know, you're the best friend I ever had. Uh, yeah, so he's using Mike as a tool in the same way that you would use your best friend as a tool if you really, really, really needed help, and so you call your best friend and ask him to help you, right? Um, yeah, that's the context for Manny, right? Um, and I love Mike's response. That is not a joke, man. No joke. Truth. I am, correction, I am honored and pleased you are my best friend, man, for you are my only friend. No comparison is logically permissible. Going to see that you have other friends. Not stupids, I mean. Mike, got an empty memory bank? Yes, man. Ten to the eighth bit's capacity. I love that. <laughs> Sorry. It's kind of adorable, isn't it? Like, ten to the eighth bit's sounded like a whole lot of capacity back in 1966, didn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, there aren't too many moments like that, actually. I think it's remarkable um, that this is a science fiction work which is primarily about computers written in the 60s, 
And there are relatively few moments like that where, you know, Heinlein's um, projection about what computing would be like, you know, 120 years later, 110 years later, um, he, he, he comes remarkably close, I think, for what he was working with, right? What he was projecting from uh, back in the mid 60s. Um, but this is one of those sort of small moments uh, when it's hard not to smile a little bit and say, I'm sure 10 to the 8th bits seemed like an absolutely incomprehensibly large quantity of memory capacity in 1966. Um, uh, exactly, Chris. We were never going to need anything more than 640K. I know. What, what would we do with it, right? For crying out loud. Um, yeah. Anyway. Good. Will you block it so that only you and I can use it? Can you? Can and will. Block signal, please. Uh, Bastille Day was my birthday, as Professor de la Paz had told me years earlier. Um, several things from this. Um, Mike's immediate, or sorry, Manny's immediate response um, to Mike emphasizing that he is his only friend um, is to is immediately say, going to see that you have other friends. And here I don't think he has a selfish motivation, right? He's going eventually, I mean, there's going to be use that's going to be, there's, there's good that's going to come of this. There's use that's going to come of this. But I don't think that that's his motivation here. Going to see that you have other friends seems to be merely a friendly response. He doesn't want Mike to be lonely. Um, he would like to, you know, remember, he, it was, he was shocked to discover that he was the only one who was Mike's friend. It was just in his previous conversation with Mike that he learned that. He, he always assumed that Mike must talk to other people too. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Stephen Cover says, I think my audiobook copy of this book is larger <laughs> than 10 to the 8th bits. I think so, actually, yeah. About 125 megs, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, agreed, agreed. Um, but um, anyway, okay, so I... So yeah, I, again, I love that this you know just the 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 generosity, um, you know, and friendliness of of Manny's response there, um, as well as the the interpersonal denseness of Mike's response. Right, uh, you are my best friend, man. For you are my only friend. No comparison is logically permissible. <laughs> right, like that's okay. Right, you're my best friend because you're the only one I have. Um, uh, is um, not the most heartwarming way to reciprocate uh, Manny's statement. Um, so again, we can you know here see sort of Mike's uh, emotive limitations, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, but um, but we can see we can see the the room for growth here. Um, that and exactly as uh, you were saying there uh, Mike on YouTube uh, man he was born on Bastille Day yeah he is uh, despite his resistance right despite his lack of enthusiasm for the revolution at the beginning he is as you say a true son of the revolution right that it's it is his it is his destiny as we can see uh from the beginning and even the fact that he is using bastille day as his code word right um he and mike are already on the road to revolution even though he himself doesn't fully realize it yet um yeah yeah um Yeah, Christopher, we were actually talking, we, I think last week we talked about this a little bit. Um, yeah, the parallels between Mike and Data uh, from Star Trek are really, are really interesting, actually. I think that would be another really interesting moot paper, um, uh, that comparison there. Um, Jocelyn, great question. I was thinking about that, too. What did Mike correct himself? What did he start saying? I am, and he corrects himself and says, I am honored and pleased. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, 
I'm not sure. Arthur says, when he was in high school, our computer moved from tape to a new thing called a hard drive. It had all the storage we would ever need. 5,000 bytes. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Uh, Arthur, uh, cleaning my house recently, I just came across my old box of uh, uh, floppy drives of the first computer games I ever played, uh, which I still have because I can't bear to throw them away. Um, so, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, but yeah Jocelyn I don't know what I'm trying to figure Jocelyn he corrects it to I am honored and pleased does that mean that the original statement he was making was a, was a parallel statement of his own response was he going to say I am something else right um, you know was he going to was he going to state it perhaps in a way which would have sounded less human like perhaps he was going to say something like you know i i am i don't know i am satisfied to learn that or what you know like something really kind of cold and then he corrects it to something warmer and more human i am honored and pleased still not awesome but better you know uh, uh, as far as that goes that's so it seems to me possible or maybe he wasn't going to do that maybe he the the parallelism the fact that he was starting both sentences with i am suggest that to me that kind of um that kind of approach it's also possible that he was going to merely make a different statement um entirely and then corrected himself because he realized he should make a statement about how he feels in response to that um <laughs> James, you guessed what was on my disc. Uh, Zork, indeed, was one of the was uh, was uh, is on one of those discs uh, in that little box I found. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, uh, it is possible, James, that he was going to say uh, that he was only that he was going to say that he was pleased, and then he added honored and pleased. Yeah, that seems very plausible. I could definitely believe that. Um, I could definitely believe that. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> and yes, Mike, King's Quest was another one of those games. <laughs> are you going to play the game where you try to guess which, which were the games in my box that I found? Yep, those, those are two of them. Uh, Zork and King's Quest were definitely two of those games. Anyway, but let's keep... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus. I'm so focused. We're moving forward. Um... He tells Wyo about Mike, right? And Mike's first, or Wyo's first reaction is that she is, she's amazed to hear this, right? About that, you know, that there's this sentient computer and stuff. Then, and she wants to meet him, right? Um, and Mike says, oh yeah, you, or Manny says, oh yeah, you can't. Um, only I can get in there because it's, you know, it's in the authority complex. And that's when she, she's like, holy cow, this is the warden's own computer that we're talking about, right? And she immediately goes to this plan, right? Um, do you think you could get in there with some plastic explosives, right? Um, she asks him, can Mike hurt? And Mike and Manny says, um, you know, uh, he can have his feelings hurt. Yeah. Um, Notice that already the discrepancy there. On the one hand, Wyo definitely is, um, Wyo definitely is thinking of Mike to some extent as a person, right? She wouldn't even be asking if he could feel pain if she weren't thinking of him as a person. Um, if she were merely thinking of him as a machine, she would not even ask that question. But we see how Manny is like more deep in thinking of him as a person because his first thought is like having his feelings hurt, which does not seem to be even on Wyo's radar screen, right? Um, I don't mean that. I mean, can he be hurt, feel pain? What? No. Can get feelings hurt, but can't feel pain. Don't think he can. No, sure he can't. Doesn't have receptors for pain. Why? She covered eyes and said softly, Bog, help me. Then looked up and said, don't you see, Manny? 
you have a pass to go down where this computer is. But most loonies can't even leave the tube at, the st at that st can't even leave the tube at that station. It's for authority employees only. Much less go inside the main computer room. I had to find out if it could feel pain because, well, because you got me feeling sorry for it with your talk about how it was lonely. But Manny, do you realize what a few kilos of tall wall plastic would do th would do there? Certainly do. Was shocked and disgusted. Yes, we'll strike right after the explosion, and Luna will be free. Mm, I'll get you explosives and fuses, but we can't move until we are organized to exploit it. Manny, I've got to get out of here. I must risk it. I'll go put on makeup. She started to get up. Um, uh, so for those of you who uh, haven't been in earlier sessions, bog means god. Um, this is the word that they use for God. It's a Slavic expression, so it's an example of the, you know, the, the kind of the polyglot society uh, of Luna. Um, and it seems to be how they, all of them, Wyo as well as the Davis family, uh, refer to God sort of privately um, when they're making statements like this. Bog, forgive me, for instance. Um yeah, good. James Lubeck is pointing out how she begins by saying he. Um, uh, can he hurt? And then she tries to distance herself when she's actually describing blowing him up. Um, she, uh, you got me feeling sorry for it with your talk about how it was lonely. I agree, James. That pronoun shift uh, is, um, is, is significant. Um, and Carrie, you're right. Even after Wyo knew Mike was a real person, she was ready to kill him. Yes, yes. And I would say in Wyo's defense, she knows that, right? That she is, um, when she responds to Manny's outrage, um, wait, I'm trying to remember, do I? Yes, okay, I do. We'll talk about that in a moment. In fact, let's go on and read that and then we'll talk about it all. Manny's really angry at this idea, right? And here's how she tries to explain. Shorty was, she said soberly, my best friend here and one of my best friends anywhere. He was all that I admire in a man, loyal, honest, intelligent, gentle and brave and devoted to the cause. But have you seen me grieving over him? No, too late to grieve. It's never too late for grief. I've grieved every instant since you told me. But I locked it in the back of my mind, for the cause leaves no time for grief. Manny, if it would have brought freedom to, for Luna or even been part of the price, I would have eliminated Shorty myself, or you, or myself, and yet you have qualms over blowing up a computer. Not that at all, but was in part. When a man dies, doesn't shock me too much. We get death sentences day we are born. But Mike was unique, and no reason not to be immortal. Never mind souls. Prove Mike did not have one. And if no soul, so much worse. No? Think twice. We'll come back to his philosophical statements there in a moment. Um, what I want to emphasize here first is Wyo, right? Wyo's immediate response that by killing Mike, <clears throat> we can benefit the cause enormously um, doesn't show that she doesn't think he's a person. It shows that she's willing to sacrifice him for the sake of the cause. As she explains, she would have been willing to sacrifice Shorty or Manny or herself, right? Um, so whether or not you... Um, can support that uh, uh, frame of mind, it does not, it does show that she does not, she's not just disregarding him as a person. Um, these other people, in fact, even people like, you know, Shorty, whom she uh, uh, speaks with great affection about, um, uh, she, um, she is willing, you know, states herself anyway, willing to sacrifice. Um, for the sake of the cause. It is an expression of how much the cause means to her. It's not that she doesn't think that killing Mike would be wrong, would be bad, but it would be worth it. It would be worth it for the sake of the cause. Um, and the conflicting values in place here are that um, she thinks that, like, she's like, she's saying, I would be, I would die. I would, I would kill my best friend or die myself for the sake of the cause, and yet you have qualms over blowing up a computer. It's just a computer, right? So there is a little bit of a, of a you know, it's, uh, she does, 
slight him as a person to some extent, right? But again, what she's saying is like it it can't possibly be on the same level. Right? It can't possibly not as the same as like your care for yourself or your care for your best friend, at least, right? Except Mike has or Manny has just said to Mike that he's the best friend he ever had, right? And I think that Manny means that, right? Um, um Yeah, yeah. Um but Carrie, you're right. Wyo wants to use Mike too, and we can see the difference between how Wyo wants to use him or take advantage of him, right? Um, she wants to use, at the best, she wants to use Mike as a suicide bomber. Now, this is a bad plan, as we will see. I mean, imagine, you know, there's... Um, we can guess already, even if this is the first time reading through the book, and if we've read through the book before, we know for certain that blowing up Mike would be doing the opposite of helping the cause, right? Um, it is extremely... Um, it is extremely um, short-term thinking uh, on her part, right? Um, she can own she, and and a, a limited imagination on her part as well. She can only see the chaos that would be caused and the damage that could be done to the warden and the authorities' operation if their primary computer was destroyed. Um, uh, now, of course, as Manny's going to go on to show her. Um, she's also lacking imagination to imagine the harm she's going to do to everybody else in Luna City uh, if um, uh, if she destroys Mike. Um, but you're right, Jocelyn. Also, in Wyo's defense, she hasn't met Mike yet, and so all she has is Manny's telling her that he's awake and can get his feelings hurt. Um, so it's possible, right? It's possible that Manny's just being sentimental or something, right? Um, she hasn't met Mike yet. So I agree that that does, that that does make a difference here. Um, now, to Manny's more philosophical statements there. Um, he admits, and I think in retrospect, um, what he says in parentheses there, I wouldn't, Devora, put this into our category of Manny addressing his audience necessarily. I mean, he does at the end, right? He uses the imperative voice and, you know, think twice. Um, uh, so that is addressing his audience. But it's not the primary function of this, right? The primary function of this seems to be Manny reflecting back on this event later. At the time when he said not that at all, that's probably what he meant. As he goes on to it, because what he goes on to con contemplate in this parenthetical st uh, uh, st statement is no, makes no part of the conversation he's going on to have with Wyo, right? So at the time, he's not dwelling on this. But thinking back on it, he says, it was in part, right? In retrospect, he doesn't say in retrospect, but it seems to me to imply in retrospect, in part it was that he had qualms over blowing up a computer. And not just any computer. Um, but Mike was unique, and no reason not to be immortal. When a man dies, doesn't shock me too much. We get death sentences day we are born. Everybody dies, right? Everybody dies. It's only a question of um, when, of how long until you die, right? Um, I had a, uh, I had a doctor friend once who, uh, somebody once made a comment about how like you save lives every day and. Um, and my doctor friend said, I don't save lives. I only prolong them, um, <laughs> which which is true. Um, we get sent death sentences day we are born. It is in the nature of humans to die. Um, Mike, though, is unique. So there are kind of two things there. First of all, it's not in Mike's nature to die. No reason not to be immortal. Right. So. To bring destruction to Mike is to do is to violate the natural order in a way, um, um, uh, in a way that um, uh, uh, it's just not against the natural order for humans to die under under any circumstances, right? Um, uh, but. Um, But there's more to it than that. It's also his uniqueness. Mike was unique, 
right, um, to destroy Mike is not just to kill somebody. It is to, like, stop what? Like, the evolution of an entire new species? The birth of an entirely new life form? I mean, it's a bigger deal than killing a person um, in, you know, in Manny's thinking here. Um, there is something truly special about Mike, right? Um, uh, I mean, it's like the difference between, you know, two random people dying and, like, killing off Adam and Eve, right? I mean, that's kind of like, what's well, one way in, in which Manny seems to be thinking about this. And then there's the business about souls. Never mind souls, right? He's anticipating a counter-argument, right? But humans have souls, and, you know, Mike is just a machine. He doesn't have a soul. Um, to which he proactively responds, prove Mike did not have one. Um, by the way, this is a... Um, this is a, a very typical Mannyism. We see him do this kind of thing a lot. Manny very often just brushes off um, this kind of speculation, right? And that way, proving that he doesn't um, really kind of speaks to Manny's like worldview. Right? He doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about this kind of question. Um, he is much quicker to treat Mike as if he had a soul than speculate about whether or not he does, right? He can't prove that he doesn't, and so therefore is clearly going to act like he does. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, his think twice, um, I guess that's like the closest he gets to philosophical debate in this way. He's just not invested enough to really go through. He's not invested enough. He's not pedantic enough. He doesn't, he doesn't do the debate, right? But he does raise it. Think twice, right? Um, exactly, Carrie. The death of a soulless being uh, is horrible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, because if he doesn't have a soul, then his current life is by definition all that he has and so you're like if a human has a soul then his death means less because you're not killing the soul right um, you're not taking away from him all that he has you might be ending his life right but you're not taking away but if mike has no soul if you know a creature that has no soul and you kill it you are ending it right it's a bigger deal um yeah um yeah, yeah. Um, that's my speculation anyway, as to what Manny is pointing to there, what what the speculations are that he's pointing to. Um, Wendy, all I can say is he seems to be anticipating, again, he doesn't engage in the debate, he doesn't spell out the terms, he doesn't engage in the debate. Um, but his statement, never mind souls, prove Mike did not have one, suggests to me that he is anticipating the, the objection. He's anticipating, he is speaking in pre preemptive response to somebody who would say, but wait a second, he's just a computer, he doesn't have a soul. That's, that's anyway, that's how I read that. That's what it seems to me that he's anticipating. Um, uh, that seems to be the argument he's rebutting. And so, you know, does that mean that Manny himself, obviously Manny himself would not make that claim that Mike has no soul and therefore it doesn't matter. Um, maybe he doesn't even, Manny doesn't even believe in souls. The fact that he puts souls in per, in quotation marks suggests that that's a possibility. Um, but again, that doesn't seem to me to matter in this passage. What seems to matter in this passage is that he believes that other people would make that argument. And so he has a counter argument for you. If you think souls are important, um, then think about the fact that if he doesn't have a soul, it would make it that much worse to kill him. Now I'm going to stop talking about this in close parentheses, right? Uh, just with think twice, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, in Wyo's further defense, um, she is one of the ones who's going to be making the really, she's the one who's going to make the really important turn, but um, they're trying to figure out Mike, right? He's trying to explain Mike. Um, 
she's concerned if he's the warden's own computer, right? Then clearly the warden, he's going to be loyal to the warden or the warden can control him, right? That's, and it's, it's a very natural thing for her to think, right? And a natural question for her to, especially for a revolutionist, right? Um, he tries to explain. Don't know what I mean, I admitted, but don't think warden controls computers. Wouldn't know a computer from a pile of rocks. Warden or staff decides policies, general plans. Half-competent technicians program these into Mike. Mike sorts them, makes sense of them, plans detailed programs, parcels them out where they belong, keeps things moving. But nobody controls Mike. He's too smart. He carries out what is asked because that's how he's built. But he's self-programming logic, makes own decisions, and a good thing, because if he weren't smart, system would not work. I still don't see what you mean by getting him on our side. Oh, Mike doesn't feel loyalty to Warden. As you pointed out, he's a machine. But if I wanted to foul up phones without touching air or water or lights, I would talk to Mike. If it struck him funny, he might do it. Couldn't you just program it? I understood that you can get into the room where he is. If I or anybody programmed such an order into Mike without talking it over with him, program would be placed in hold location and alarms would sound in many places. But if Mike wanted to, I told her about check for umpteen jillion. Mike is still finding himself, Wyo and lonely, told me I was his only friend, and was so open and vulnerable I wanted to bawl. Um, first of all, well, I'm going to play my remember ahead trick, because um, it's only remembering ahead a chapter or two, and we're going to get there in a moment. Um, but remember ahead to what soon we are going to discuss the passage in which Prof talks about personal versus corporate responsibility, right? And when we get there, I want us to remember that Manny already understands this on some level, as he is explaining right here. Um, it's easy to step back and say, Mike is the warden's computer, right? Therefore, the warden controls the computer. And but what Manny understands is that's not how it works. The warden wouldn't know a computer from a pile of rocks. Is this the warden's computer? Yes. Does the computer do what the warden wants? Yes. But there's no personal relationship between the warden and the computer. Right? He doesn't know the computer. He is not a friend of the computer. Um... The warden, or more likely his staff, decides the policies. They tell the half-competent computer technicians um, what those policies are, and the, and the half-competent technicians program those into Mike. And then Mike makes sense of them, plans his programs, and keeps things moving. Um, having received these programs, Mike figures out the best way to implement them. Right, But nobody controls Mike. Um, so f there are two levels of issue here. One is that the question of controlling the computer is much more indirect than Y.O. thinks from the outside, not knowing how the system actually works, right? It is not, in fact, the warden who controls Mike. At most, it's the half-competent technicians that put the programs into Mike that are they're the only ones actually interacting with the computer, right? But, of course... They don't control Mike either, because nobody controls Mike. He's too smart. He makes his own decisions about how to carry out his programming. They can program him. They can program parameters in. Um, uh, but they don't make the final decisions. He carries out what is asked because that's how he's built, but he's self-programming logic makes own decisions, um, as he's required to do in order to make the system run properly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Stephen, even dumb computers tend to act beyond the control of most users. Exactly, exactly. As I was... Uh, <laughs> I couldn't help but think of this passage. I had just gone through and and uh, you know I'd just been rereading um, a 
couple of days ago when I was sitting down with my mother-in-law trying to teach my mother-in-law to use a new app that she'd never used before. And I was reminded of the not knowing a computer from a pile of rocks thing, right? Uh, like, how do you, how do I, you know, get from like her saying, I want this thing to happen to like, you know, what buttons to push to make this happen and, and, and thinking about this, the indirectness of this system, right? And how this works. Um, yes, yes. Fortunately, her phone is uh, smart enough uh, to, uh, make its own decisions about some of the things that, uh, that she wants. But of course, even it not is, uh, not, uh, nearly so smart as Mike, of course. Um, which is a shame really, because there were several times when I would have just liked to ask her phone to, um, just please <laughs> let her tell it what to do and, and it would do it. Um, not quite there yet. Um, but as I say, remember, to uh, remind me to link this back to the politics later on. Um, Wyo still thinks, you know, couldn't you just program it? Because notice that he keeps saying ifs, right? Um, if it struck him funny, he might do it. Um, if it struck him funny. So maybe Mike would help us. And she's like, well, wouldn't it be safer just to program it? Right? Because you you can you can write a program and force computers to do things. In other words, she's still not really fully thinking of Mike as a person. Um, and what Manny points out is, you know, not just that he wouldn't do that um, to Mike, that is, but that that would not be the way to go about it. Right? He's trying to help her understand the computer and the computer's perspective, right? Not only just to conceive of him as a person, which is still clearly a work in progress uh, with Wyo at this point. Um, she still doesn't really get it. It's not as intuitive to her as it is to Manny, clearly. And yet, it's not just that. It's also she doesn't understand. She knows some facts about computer, which are true, right? You program a computer, it does a thing. Right. And that's true of Mike, too. As we'll see, that's still a reality of Mike's world. Right. Of Mike's parameters of Mike's system. It's how his structure is set up and he can't change that. Mike's incapable of changing that. Um, so she's not wrong to say that you can program him and force him to do something. Right. Um, but it's not just that that's not a smart way to go about it because alarms would sound in many places if a strange program appeared in Mike. Um, but it's also disadvantageous. Mike is way smarter. Better to just ask him for help and let him figure out how to help. But even more importantly, yeah, above that yet, I, I, I don't want to treat Mike that way, right? Um, was so open and vulnerable, I wanted to bawl this emotional connection that he has with Mike is really clear and really important. Um, yeah. Now, Jocelyn, you're right. Mike is able to work around his parameters, as we'll see. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, one little interesting uh, point here at the very end of Chapter 5. Um this is after he and Prof uh, and Wyo have been talking about revolutions and how revolutions are set up, and he's going through the whole cell structure and secrecy and how it should work. Um, and Manny says, but Prof, I went on, there's a better way to rig it. Really? Many revolutionary theorists have hammered this out, Manuel. I have such confidence in them that I'll offer you a wager at, say, ten to one? Ought to take your money. Take same cells. Arrange an open pyramid of tetrahedrons. Where vertices are in common, each bloke knows one in adjoining cell, knows how to send message to him, that's all he needs. Communications never break down because they run sideways as well as up and down. Something like a neural net. That's why you can knock a hole in a man's head, take a chunk of brain out, and not damage thinking much. Excess capacity. Messages shunt around. He loses what was destroyed but goes on functioning. Manny 
blows Prof's mind, right? Uh, and, um, you know, immediately sees a better way to set up a set of clandestine communications and and uh, and and re uh, rebel cells um, than generations and gen you know centuries worth of revolutionary theorists, because he thinks like a computer, right? He thinks in computer language. He's you know he Manny calls this an idiot circuit. Um, uh, he says, oh, I've, you know, of course it'll work. It was idiot circuit. Right. Um, yeah. Um, uh, no, Stephen, I did not, in fact, draw a picture of an open pyramid of tetrahedrons. Um, I very briefly uh, thought about doing that, but I decided not to, um, mostly because Manny cautioned me about how hard it was. Uh, so I decided not to try. Um, but um, uh, anyway, yeah. So once again, and, and remember um, Wyo and Prof's responses to this, right? The response to this is to opt him as the chairman of the revolution, right? Uh, congratulations, you're in charge of the revolution. It's settled, right? Um, Manny, what in their mind makes Manny the logical, like the, the ideal leader of their conspiracy? Um, is the fact that he speaks computer language, right? This is to Manny really, really simple, right? This is simple computer logic, right? Um, all that he learned about revolution, he learned from computers, right? Uh, from, from computer programming. Um, this is simple to him. The point that I would, one of the points that I would make here is that once again, we see Manny at the boundary, Right. Mike, of course, the actual computer is really going to be the chairman as they quickly decide once the three of them, once they introduce Prof to Mike uh, and all four of them talk for a while. Um, Mike is going to become the chairman. Right. Manny uh, looks like he should be the chairman because he's a little bit like Mike or at least more like Mike than they are. Um, once again, he is. He is the transition. He is the boundary, right? He is the, the one um, with one arm in the human world and one arm in the computer world. Um, and because of that, because of that junction, because of that um, connection, <clears throat> he is, they immediately kind of acclaim him uh, as the logical chairman for the revolution. And I think that's really, that's really interesting. Arthur says, every engineering or science major has dreamed of having this conversation with a humanities student. Yes, it is true. It is true. Um, yes. Um, and immediately uh, having your natural leadership uh, acclaimed uh, because of, uh, you know, the obviously superior way that you think uh, as a, as a engineering or science person, Arthur. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's just how it works. But again, I think it's one of the things which is consistently true of the revolution as we will see it, uh, develop is it really is about the, that boundary, right? That's why Manny is such a critical person because he is the one who lives on that boundary. It's all about that interface. What the Luna is going to win, and the reason Luna is going to win is that they are the not stupids uh, who talk to the computer uh, and um, you know kind of enter into uh, that world and apply that way of thinking um, because they can change. They change their paradigm, right? Or at least some of them. Do and Manny is the the leader of this, right? Change their paradigm to embrace the concept uh, of a computer who is a person and who is alive uh, and awake, and can and can uh, sort of shift that and apply it. Um, okay, now, <clears throat> but Manny is having none of it, right? Um, so back to politics for a bit. Manny does not, is still resistant to the revolution. Now, I said, after we toasted, Prof, what do you think of pennant race? Got money, says Yankees, can't do it again? Manuel, what is your political philosophy? With that new boy from Milwaukee, I feel like investing. 
Sometimes a man doesn't have it defined, but under Socratic inquiry, knows where he stands and why. I'll back him against Field. Three to two. What? You young idiot. How much? Three hundred. Hong Kong. Done. For example, under what circumstances may the state justly place its welfare above that of a citizen? So, uh, the Manny's attempts to distract Prof, uh, I, I find this scene really funny um, uh, because we can see the game that's being, we can see the, 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 the battle that's happening, right? Um, is Manny going to break down and talk politics like uh, uh, Prof is trying to force him to, or is Manny going to succeed in distracting Prof? Um, and when he offers a wager, uh, he, uh, uh, he temporarily succeeds, right, uh, and diverts uh, Prof into uh, uh, accepting a bet, right, uh, to bet on or against the Yankees. And of course, as he's uh, uh, backing the Yankees, uh, Manny finds out and is going to find out very soon what he should have known sooner, uh, that uh, he is backing a loser. Um, sorry, did my... The fact that I'm a Red Sox fan kind of come through there, maybe. Uh, it's the one thing I find least sympathetic about uh, Manny, but I guess it's, you know, it keeps me from, you know, uh, heroizing him too much, I suppose. Um, but anyway, um, Manny absolutely wants nothing to do with politics, but more, even more, he doesn't want anything to do with political discussion. He's going to be quicker to join a revolution than he's going to be to talk about politics, right? Manny doesn't really care under what circumstances may the state justly place its welfare above that of a citizen. Um, he is not interested in um, he's not interested in talking about that and we see him insisting that he doesn't. Um, so Wyo tests Prof. But Professor, what are your political beliefs? I am a rational anarchist. I don't know that brand. Anarchist individualist? Anarchist communist? Christian anarchist? Philosophical anarchist? Syndicalist? Libertarian? Those I know. But what's this? Randite? I can get along with a Randite. A rational anarchist believes that concepts such as state and society and government have no existence save as physically exemplified in the acts of self-responsible individuals. He believes that it is impossible to shift blame, share blame, distribute blame, as blame, guilt, responsibility are matters taking place inside human beings singly and nowhere else. But being rational, he knows that not all individuals hold his evaluations, so he tries to live perfectly in an imperfect world, aware that his effort will be less than perfect, yet undismayed by self-knowledge of self-failure. Here, here, I said, less than perfect, what I've been aiming for my, all my life. You've achieved it, said Wyo. Professor, your words sound good, but there is something slippery about them. Too much power in the hands of individuals. Surely you would not want, well, H-missiles, for example, to be controlled by one irresponsible person? My point is that one person is responsible. Always. If H-bombs exist, and they do, some man controls them. In terms of morals, there is no such thing as state. Just men. Individuals. Each responsible for his own acts. Anybody need a refill? I asked. Notice again how we see Manny throughout continuing to resist. Manny not only trying not to engage and even heckling the political uh, discussion, but continually trying to distract from it, or at least, if all comes to the worst, drown it. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're right, Ellen. He really does get <clears throat> get dragged into uh, taking sides. Um, Stephen, it is an interesting element about loonies, their love of betting, right? Which Manny assures us is absolutely endemic. Um, they are a gambling people. Um, all loonies love to bet. I don't know why, exactly. Or rather, I have not thought through what that tells us. 
about their society. Um, is it about risk taking and willingness to take risks? Is it about desire for improvement? Like the hope of winning, I bet. Is it about lack of attachment to what you have, that you're willing to, you know, to risk it, to gamble it, knowing that it's likely that you'll lose it? Um, yeah, about beating the odds, Carrie? Does that suggest that they're confident? I mean, as Manny says elsewhere, by surviving, all loonies beat the odds already, right? So does that mean they all think they're lucky? Um, are they all confident in their um, um, in their in their backing, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, the core of Prof's principle. A rational anarchist believes that concepts such as state and society and government have no existence save as physically exemplified in the acts of self-responsible individuals. Again, you see the connection that I was suggesting back to Manny's statement about the warden and his computer, right? Um, to say the warden controls Mike is a mere abstraction. That's not what really happens. And Prof would say... The state, government, is an abstraction, too. The government doesn't do anything. People do things. Um, I love the response to, like, if, you know, um, would you trust an individual to be in control of an H-bomb? Um, to which Prof essentially replies, all H-bombs are in the control of individuals. It is always an individual um, only an individual can act. There's no such thing. Concepts such as state and society and government have no existence. There are governments in which there are people involved. Like, there are people who get together and act in a particular way that we call governing, right? But they are still, it is only those individual people acting and doing their thing, ultimately, that matter. The rest of it is just an abstraction, just like the abstraction of the warden um, controlling Mike, right? Um, so we've already gotten this little kind of, I don't know, like Cliss Notes version of Prof's philosophy, right? Mike kind of agrees with it, even though, or not Mike, Manny. Sorry, and I'm often going to, I'm sure I've made that mistake a bunch of times already. I keep, since their names both begin with him, saying the wrong one. Manny... Um, follows that, essentially. He doesn't think about it, right? He doesn't uh, hold um, a theory, right? And, and he certainly doesn't want to explain it. Um, but um, he... Uh, but Manny seems to kind of operate uh, to sort of operate this way as well, right? Um, notice even the way that he talks about Terra when he talks about why overthrowing the warden, there would be no point, right? Um, he talks about Terra, but he doesn't just talk in the abstract about like Terra is much stronger than Luna, right? Luna could never stand against Terra. He kind of talks like that, but not really. Remember, he keeps saying things like there are three million of us and 11 billion of them, right? He's thinking about all those individuals. There are 11 billion individual people down there on Terra, right? Who all are going to, do stuff, and they have the capacity to do stuff, right? They have weapons, and we don't. Um, uh, so again, he's thinking sort of in practical terms in those ways. Um, interesting. Carrie, I'm parsing your comment here. On Luna, loonies are not in control of their destiny. Everything is against them. Even in a bet, there are winners and losers. Gaining an advantage over the doom before you must be ingrained. 
trying to find a way to job the system, right? Um, since you know, and this is why they don't hesitate, are you thinking, Carrie, to like bet at odds, or even if they know the odds are against them when they bet? I mean, as they almost always are, right? I mean, who would take the other side of a bet if you felt that, you know, like if you're proposing a bet? I mean, that's why Prof takes the bet because Mike is, or Manny, sorry, is offering him long odds, right? 10 to 1. Right, ten to one that the that the Yankees are going to win the pennant this year, and Prof, you know, says, "You young idiot." Yes, I'll take that bet. Done. Um, uh, because he, yeah, it's, of course, he's going to take that bet. It's a safe bet, right? But why is Manny willing to make that bet? Why is he willing to propose that, right? Um, because he thinks he can win, not because he knows he's going to win. Right. But because he thinks he might win, is it about kind of, you know, sort of taking control? Um, but yeah, Stephen, I mean, here he, th I mean, he thinks he believes in that kid they got from Milwaukee. Right. Um, he thinks that um, the uh, he believes that he that the Yankees are going to win. Right. Um, he thinks that the odds are better than one in ten that the Yankees are going to win the pennant this year. And so he thinks he's jobbing prof out of money, right? He's expressing his confidence by making that wager, right? Um, but you're right, Stephen. He's not just going to take any bet at any odds. Um, he has to believe that they have some chance of winning, right? And that's what, of course, that's, of course, what... Um, this comes down to and he won't agree to go along because he does not think they have any chance he says there's no chance this can't work um as he's telling them here right prof is like okay let's form our action committee i said wait prof i didn't agree to anything what's this action stuff we will now overthrow the authority he said blandly how going to throw rocks at him that remains to be worked out this is the planning stage I said, Prof, you know me. If kicking out authority was thing we could buy, I wouldn't worry about price. Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Huh? A price that once was paid. Well, I'd go that high. But when I bet, I want a chance to win. Told Wyo last night, I don't object to long odds. One in ten is what you said, Manny. Da, Wyo. Show me those odds. I'll tap pot. But can you? No, Manuel, I can't. Then why we talk talk? I can't see any chance. Nor I, Manuel. But we approach it differently. Revolution is an art that I pursue rather than a goal I expect to achieve. Nor is this a source of dismay. A lost cause can be as spiritually satisfying as a victory. Not me. Sorry. Manny, Wyo said suddenly. Ask Mike. And this is the turning point of their careers. Thus, in this moment, is the revolution born on Luna. When Wyo says, ask Mike. Um, ask Mike to calculate the odds and tell you, is there any chance that you can win? I love the way that Wyo here serves as the intermediary between the two extreme positions, right? Manny, the, the extreme pragmatist here. I'm willing to do it. I'm wi he's willing to sacrifice. Would he pay the price of their of his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor? Yes, yes, he would. He would go that high, right? I love that that expression, right? I'd go that high. I'd pay that much. Um, but he doesn't see any chance that it would work. And if it's not going to work, he's not going to pay it. Um, he'd rather go on living the life that he lives, cheating the authority where he can, and um, you know, making out as good a life as he can make out under the oppression of the authority, um, then throw it all away for no reason. Prof's feeling is quite different, right? An art I pursue rather than a goal I expect to achieve. Prof doesn't think they can win. I love the serenity of Prof. Yeah, Ellen, it's really, it's, it's my favorite uh, part of him. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, a lost cause can be as spiritually satisfying as a victory. Um, 
notice the difference. Wyo stated her principles when she talked about her willingness to kill, you know, sacrifice her own life, give up everything for the sake of the cause, right? Prof is similarly committed, right? Except the difference is she's all of all aglow with the optimism that they can win, right? She's um, full of unrealistic expectations about what winning looks like and how easy it would be. And uh, Prof doesn't think they can win, right? Um, he is undismayed by the fact that there doesn't seem to be any realistic chance that they're going to win. But it's Wyo who, in the middle of it, says, ask Mike. Let's ask Mike to calculate it. And this, I think, is a reflection of Manny's earlier success in getting her to change her perspective about Mike. She met him, right? So she definitely feels that he's a person. She's totally on board with the personhood uh, of Mike or of Michelle, right? Um, and of Michelle, perhaps I should say. Um, but um, but she she's doing it's something more, much more than that here, right? She finds the middle ground between the idealism of Prof and the pragmatism of Manny, right? And the middle ground is, let's calculate the odds. Let's find what is, in fact, the chance to win based on everything that we know. Um, and she's going to hold him to the one in ten. If there's at least a one in ten chance that they could win, then he's in. Then it's worth the price. Then it's worth a bet. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Stephen. We have someone who's in it for the art, someone who thinks they'll win, and someone who's making a bet. Uh, nobody seems to be in it for the strictly moral reason that they think it's the right thing to do. No, I mean, I would say why is there closer than anybody else, right? I mean, she clearly believes in the cause because she believes it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, and I would say, you know, I mean, uh, Prof believes it's the right thing to do, too. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's an art that I pursue rather than a goal that I expect to perceive. Um, revolution for revolution's sake, right, is what is what Prof believes in. Um, uh yeah. Um, Bruce, I don't know what tap pot means. Show me those odds. I'll tap pot. Maybe it's a poker term. Like the pot, like in, 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 in terms of poker. Um, yeah, that's my best guess as to what it means. Okay. Right. So would you tap the pot to what, like to call, uh, you know, to or, or something like that? I don't play poker, so this metaphor is lost on me, but uh, something like that. OK. Yeah, if he has those odds, then he'll be then he'll be all in. Right. He'll he'll push all his chips to the to the middle. Yeah, I think that's what he's talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, right, exactly. I think that's probably what he means there. Notice that after Wyo makes the suggestion, Manny doesn't jump on it. Um, when Prof asks, who's Mike? Wyo says, Mike is Manny's best friend. He's very good at figuring odds. A bookie? My dear, if we bring in a fourth party, we start by violating the cell principle. I don't see why, Wyo answered. Mike could be a member of the cell Manny will head. Hmm, true. I withdraw objection. Is he safe? Can you vouch for him? Or you, Manuel? I said, he's dishonest, immature, practical joker, not interested in politics. <laughs> Manny trying to make it sound as bad as possible. Manny, I'm going to tell Mike you said that. Professor, he's nothing of the sort, and we need him. Uh, in fact, I think he might be our chairman, and we three the cell under him, the executive cell. Why, are you getting enough oxygen? I think that's Manny speaking. I'm okay. I haven't been guzzling, guzzling it, that is the vodka, the way you have. Think, Manny. Use imagination. 
I must confess, said Prof, that I find these conflicting reports very conflicting. Manny? Oh, hell. So we told him, between us, all about Mike, how he woke up, got his name, met Wyo. Why is Mike resistant to calling Mike and bringing him in? Why is Manny resistant to calling Mike and bringing him in? On the one hand, it seems the next logical extension, right? Manny's first impulse, as we saw at the very beginning of our discussion today, was um, to use Mike, right? He can make a buck off Mike. He's going to collude with Mike to make a buck, right? His next step was to get Mike's help when he needed help, to use Mike to help subvert the system, right? To use Mike to kind of, you know, call in and, um, uh, you know, um, to call Mike into the revolution and get his assistance on overthrowing the warden and overthrowing the authority seems the next logical step. Right? Why is that not occurring to Manny? Why is Manny not the one making this suggestion? As he's always been the one to be that interface. Right? It's Wyo who's been instructed by Manny, right? Who who to whom, you know, whose perspective has been broadened in these ways by Manny in their earlier conversation. Um but she she sees it. Not only does she suggest referring to him, referring the odds question to him. But she's the one to suggest that he might be our chairman, and we three the cell under him. She immediately see now, you know, her first thought, she she was a little slow to see this. She wanted to blow him up, right? Um, but um uh, she uh, um Yeah, yeah. Um She's the one, she now can see the advantages, right, to utilizing Mike's abilities in the cause, in support of the cause. Um, she had a hard time seeing what Manny meant by saying we should get Mike on our side. Um, now she sees it, right? And she's very quick now to see it and to see what it means. But why is Manny resistant? Yeah. Yeah, Mike on YouTube, I agree. Um, he's protective of Mike, is definitely part of it. Um, does he feel like Mike is going to be brought into this hopeless situation? He thinks it's hopeless, right? And if Mike gets brought in, then he could get compromised, right? He could be destroyed. Um, is he just trying to protect Mike from this year. I mean, it's not like he's trying to protect him from Wyo and Prof. I mean, apart from that whole plastic explosive suggestion, which was alarming. Um, apart from that, there's no reason to... I mean, he introduced um, Mike to Wyo, and, and you've got to think that he believes that Prof is a non-stupid as well, who could be trusted. Um, so I don't think that's it. Does he not fully trust Mike is a good question, Carrie. Does he have reason to think... I mean, is he not just trying to sandbag the thing or, you know, to scut, to undermine it when he says he's dishonest, immature, practical joker, not interested in politics? Or is that his act, you know, at least a, a version of his actual assessment, right? Um, you know, I like Mike. I admire Mike. I'm not sure we can trust Mike. He's dishonest, immature, and a practical joker, not to mention not interested in politics. So, you know, how are we going to, um, I'm not sure this is a good idea. Um, but it really does sound to me like he's just trying to turn Prof off of the idea, right? To make Mike sound like somebody that would be the last person that Prof would possibly want to trust um, uh, with this idea. Um, yeah, Stephen, I think we can see him. You know, he doesn't want to be in in the first place, and so he wants to keep his friend out as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it is possible that he believes that um, Mike will be the first one up against the wall when the revolution doesn't come, right? When the revolution goes south. Um, yeah, yeah. And so he wants to protect Mike. Um, you getting enough oxygen, I think, is Mike or Manny speaking. 
right? Um, he's implying that she's not thinking clearly. And yet the thing that she said is in fact extremely clear. Part of, I think, what's going on, I think there is part of him that is not sure if Mike's, if Mike can be trusted in the same way that like a child couldn't be trusted, right? I mean, remember Mike is a, a child with a long set of degrees, right? Um, that's Mike. Is he smart enough to be able to? Yeah, yeah. He'd be helpful. Yes, there are things he could do. Um, but is would it really be a good idea? I think he does question it. I think that he's really not... Um, I think he's really not sure. Um, Stephen is wondering if uh, Manny is worried that Mike... Mike might actually calculate odds good enough to commit him. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Manny's response when Mike does do the calculations um, uh, suggests to me that that's not so much the case. Uh, but uh, but it is a possibility. Um, and I agree, Stephen Keene, that while a suggestion is way out of the box... Uh, humans taking orders from a computer. Again, I love the way that Wyo has leapfrogged Manny here, right? She is now thinking further down this paradigm than he was, I think. Um, but that's why this is such an interesting moment to me, because we see Manny holding back. We see Manny um, sounding, at least, resistant or dense um, of exactly the things that he is usually the first one to see and the first one to move forward with. And I think it does have to do... His personal feelings are clouding his judgment, his concern for Mike, um, whether this is going to be good for him, whether this is the right... Th whether it's... Would this be exploitation of Mike? Is this right? Would, you know, um, And in the end, of course, it is right. It's taking Mike into their confidence, which is very much treating him as a person and as a best friend, um, rather than merely exploiting him, right? But are, is that another worry, you know, kind of concern that's going through um, that makes Manny resistant, you know, un, no, unusually, uncharacteristically resistant to this? Um, um, oh, that's interesting, James. James is wondering if, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, it's the fact that Mike's personality changed when he talks to Wyo. Um, is is uh, Manny worried about the effect of introducing him to more people? That's really interesting, right? It did change Mike, right? All of a sudden, he's now Michelle, uh, speaking in a French accent. Um, uh, you know, what is it going to do to Mike? Uh, to do, you know, Mike was the one, or Manny was immediately concerned for him. Is it going to be good for him? Is he going to be okay? Um, are you trying to split his personality? And, of course, remember, Wyo's response was, he's got more than enough personality to go around, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Why well, should stop? We're out of time. Um, we will look at their discussion and their initial assessments. For next time, read the next... Two more chapters. Um, uh, so we have through eight. So let's go through ten uh, for next time, and we'll see how well we do there. I seem to be alternating in my getting through quite a few uh, slides or getting through not very many. So let's hope that next time is a quite a few uh, session again. So anyway, awesome. Thank you guys for the discussion. Um, so ooh, ah, schedule. I was about to say see you next week, um, which is true. Uh, but uh, not the week after. So just to remind folks, um, I will be here next week, um, but then the week after that's Mythmoot. So I won't be, I'm, and I'm leaving on Wednesday. So um, I won't be around on Wednesday then. So we will uh, have our discussion next week, but not the week after. So just to be, uh, to be aware of that uh, as we move forward. So thanks everybody. Have a good night and I'll see you guys next week through chapter 10. Thanks very much. Bye now.